Hi, I'm Jim Clementi. I'm a retired FBI profiler and former New York City prosecutor, and this is Real Crime Profile. Today with... Laura Richards, former New Scotland Yard and FBI trained. I also set up and I'm the director of Paladin, the National Stalking Advocacy Service. And I'm Lisa Zambetti. I'm the casting director for Criminal Minds, where I cast killers, victims, and everything in between. And I have a real interest in real crime and the minds that solve those crimes. So here we are again. So today, we have just listened together to the interview for the Nancy Grace show of Jody Strakowski, Stephen Avery's fiance at one point. And we've listened to the interview. We've taken notes in our analysis, uh, Laura and I, and we are now going to discuss them. We have not discussed what our findings were yet, and uh, we hope to uh, give you some insights that we saw behaviorally in this interview. Although I'll certainly say that I have discussed this interview and the disclosure um, of Jody's account because I was asked to go on Dr. Drew the very day that actually this hit the news and this dis disclosure of um, her abuse at the hands of Stephen Avery came out. So, And there were lots of mixed reactions from people. Yeah, definitely. I mean, people, there are some people who think she's just lying and, and grandstanding and other people that believe what she has to say. So we'll be and talking about that And some people have a today. mixture of both, that those two things are intertwined together. Well, and that can happen. I mean, people can tell the truth at one point and lie at another point. So that's totally human. It's not un unusual. So why don't we get going? Mm -hmm. Laura, do you have any introductory remarks about this? Yes. I mean, I certainly have worked with thousands of victims of domestic violence. And so, you know, that's something I'll throw straight out there. And, and of course, I've worked with victims of stalking, too. And have profiled many cases and, and many murders. And certainly when I listened to her account, first of all, um, I felt that this was a very credible and genuine account from somebody who had been coercively controlled and unable to say things for a long time. And I certainly felt that, you know, the detail of what she said, certainly some of those incidents had been reported to the police. So we're not talking about somebody coming out with things at a later date that hadn't been corroborated. Yeah, these were contemporaneous reports at the time of the incidents, which are very much more reliable than somebody's memory after mm. a decade. Absolutely. And, and she was being asked questions on this interview, you know, as Jim said, about some things that happened eight or nine years before. Um, so unless things are very significant, they won't tend to stand out. But I certainly feel that there are a number of key remarks that she makes about Stephen Avery's behaviour, that, yes, he did commit those domestic abuse offences against her. And when you look at what Laurie says, the former uh, wife of Stephen Avery, Laurie Matheson, actually some of those things are corroborated by what Laurie tells us as well, not just in the acts, but certain words and phrases that are used too. One of the first things that I noticed in this interview when it was when Jody said that he beat me all the time. And then she said, he threw me against the wall. I tried to leave, so he smashed the windshield of my car so I couldn't leave him. And that already has some details that really ring true to me. And again, throwing me against the wall, it's that action, that, that, that spatial relationship, that kind of detail typically is what we see in, in truthful accounts. Um, she said, I tried to leave, so he smashed the windshield. It's very active. It's not, it's not sort of a two-dimensional description of what happened. It's a three-dimensional description. And there are other indicators as we go along uh, about that. But um, she said, I was at work one day, and he was up there spying through a window. Okay. The fact that she said up there, again, it's a spatial relationship. Right. In other words, she didn't say he was, he was spying through a window. He, she said he was up there spying through a window. So he must have been at, a, at an elevated location looking down through the window. And that, again, is a spatial relationship that makes me believe this is a truthful account. And the other thing I'd say to that um, is that we would call that behavior stalking. And this is stalking within a relationship when she talks about him micromanaging her so going to her workplace, watching to see what she's doing, who she's speaking to. And that happened on numerous occasions where he's trying to see who of, of which other men who work there, who she's interacting with, threatening her, threatening them. 
and other times where she's going to meet her parents where he's sat opposite um, her in the street but in the car with a pair of binoculars again watching what she's doing so for Jodie she would have felt that he's everywhere and nowhere in the sense that she can't do anything without him being present so these are some of the control mechanisms that abusers use it's not physical it's much more psychological in terms of what he's doing. And intimidating, right. And, and the interviewer sort of was incredulous when she said, but you were with him for two years. Why were you with him for two years? Was it, was it bad the entire time? And she said, after the first week. And is that normal in your experience in, in a relationship to have sort of a honeymoon period in the first week and then completely changing? Well, you know... Every victim experience is different. And so with Jodie's, you know, listening to that, I was interested to, to hear what she said about this whirlwind relationship because you have to remember things have happened incredibly quickly here. She says that she's outside somebody else's trailer that she's looking after. He appears with his nephew and they offer to, to help her fix the car. And they end up having some drinks, and the very next day he moves in. Right, he and moves in. He moves in. Yeah, yeah yes. but the way I just have to... What I noticed is she's like, oh, the next thing I knew, he moved in. I mean, there just seems to be some gaps in that. But it was the next day. Yeah, so they're out there drinking yeah. that night, and then he moves in the next day. I've seen that numerous times, actually, where somebody moves in very quickly, this mm -hmm. whirlwind relationship. And sometimes you're talking, you know, hours, half a day, mm -hmm. you know, an evening when somebody's met. Um, and she goes along with this. So, of course there must have been some element where she's willing in that sense that he actually moves his stuff in, whatever that entails. And, you know, within a week, the abuse starts. Now, it's not clear exactly what what the abuse is right from the start. Normally, we see much more psychological things to begin with as opposed to physical things right from the off. And actually, most victims of abuse don't even self-identify as being abused. It's only when they look back or they've gone through counselling. And, of course, she has said that she's gone through intense counselling where they start to understand that all the psychological stuff is actually abuse rather than it's just the relationship. And they only tend to talk about abuse when it becomes physical. But we know most per per perpetrators, excuse me, won't be physically abusive all the time either. They will use psychological tactics. And it's only when they don't get what they want that, in my experience, they start to use the physical or sexual side to reinforce the punishment if the other tactics aren't getting them, you know, what they're seeking to achieve, which is normally power and control. And she said, uh, and he moved in the next day and I couldn't get rid of him. I think... There may be, if you're talking about the gap in between, there may have been, there must have been some kind of attraction. I mean, she did invite him in for drinks. Uh, they did share some time together. We don't know what actually went on that night. I mean, And I'm not saying she was asking. I mean, that's not what I'm implying, that she's asking for any of this. I'm just, no. I just think there's more to this. But there story, probably is, you know? but it goes back to the old adage, abusers are not abusive all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, killers do not kill all the time. So, you know, we could bring in a number of domestic violence offenders now into this studio and they would be able to behave and interact with us and some of them would be very charismatic and they would hold court with us and they wouldn't necessarily choose to be abusive towards us. But abusers do pick and choose who they're abusive to and with Stephen Avery, we do have a pattern of behaviour. I was interested in not just what Jodie was saying but also matching it back to... Laurie, mm -hmm. who Laurie Matheson, who you know, lots of people haven't heard being discussed yeah, present day. I was really curious about her, but you know, she was interesting in the sense that she was 19 years of age, incredibly stunningly good looking. She was a single mother and she gets hooked up with Avery very quickly again, another whirlwind relationship. And she has numerous children by Avery. And she has a number of, or she calls the police a number of times. And there's one time where she flees to a refuge, and that tells me that things are so serious mm -hmm. that a young mother is that terrified that she has picked herself and her, or her children up and has disappeared herself because she is so fearful. And she does go back into the relationship, but while Stephen Avery is in prison, she uses that as an opportunity to leave him, which we do see once mm -hmm. somebody's been given respite. And Stephen Avery starts sending some threatening letters to her, saying, threatening her life, but saying that she will pay for what she has done. But that 
crosses with what Jodie says, that he threatens her that she will pay too. There are certain phrases that he uses to keep Mm -hmm. women in his life in check. But I also think it's an interesting point that Laurie doesn't just leave him and divorce him. She actually ends up marrying Brendan and Bobby Dassey's father. What? (laughs) Yeah, they end up, she is now Laurie Dassey and she is married to Peter Dassey. And just thinking about Stephen Avery's mindset, I just wonder how au fait he is with this arrangement, given that he's in prison, and Laurie ends up divorcing him. He's threatening her, he can't control her, and she ends up in another relationship. So when he comes out of prison and he meets Jodie, this relationship happens very, very quickly. And he talks about, you bitches owe me. I wonder exactly who else he's talking about here, because for me, I think it is an accumulation of... Uh, sort of debts that he feels that women have accrued uh, or that he intends to pay womankind back, not just uh, keep Jodie in check, but there's also things about Laurie that he is now having to contend with and and live with. And Jodie may well mean everything to him, which ups the stakes of why he wants to keep her controlled. And, you know, the question the interviewer asks, and it's one of the questions that I cringe whenever I hear it asked of of an abused woman... Why did you stay? You know, why didn't you leave? As if the whole owner should always be on the victim, who actually, at most there at the points in this abusive relationship, women become entrapped, and it's not as easy just to walk out the door. And that's exactly what Jodie's trying to describe, that she felt that she couldn't because he was controlling every aspect of her life, and she had nowhere else to go either. So on top of that... She said she describes, Jody re- describes when he first started basically hitting her. He, she said, he choked me, he started hitting me, and then I called the police. And he dragged me out of the house so we'd be gone when the cops came. She was basically almost unconscious or unconscious when he was dragging her out of the house. And the police did find them in the car after this report. So that's current corroboration at the time that it happened that that he had dragged her out and threw her in the car. She wasn't going to call the police and then lying and then jump into the car with this guy. So they and he's stopped. he's trying to flee the scene. He is trying to flee the scene with the evidence, which is her. And then when they find her, they said they didn't find any marks on her neck, even though she said he was choking her. And But yet they still arrested him. So they must have found some corroborating evidence or they must have been convinced by her report that there was something going on. Now, I don't know if the 911 call had any kind of information on it. I mean, if they were in the middle of it when when uh, he, she called, that that may have been in the background recorded. So either way, he, she ends up, he ends up uh, being arrested. And what do the cops do? They order them to stay apart for three days. That's the remedy. Why did you stay with him? Well, the cops only protected her for three days. They didn't protect her for the rest of her life. And So she was stuck in that relationship. Absolutely. And, I mean, the other issue that I have just with that account and the interview where the interviewer says, you know, the police didn't find any marks on her neck. Well, actually, bruising takes a number of days to come up. So I train police officers all the time uh, about when they attend a scene, how they separate the victim and the perpetrator, or that's what they should do, that if somebody is alleging that they've been strangled or choked, that they will not see evidence. People bruise differently. Right. For example, different skin and types. And you need to take pictures over the next over few days to see to whether see there's ever any the injuries. Bruising. In fact, you can tell if somebody's been victimized repeatedly because there are different colors, different layers of bruises on on the same as areas. any bruise. We exactly. all bruise. And if you think about your own bodies, when you bruise, you know, a bruise, that come, it takes time to come out and different colors. Yeah, so it might be green, like green at first, and then it can get yellow and then it can get dark purple and red. And then it could go fade off to like this blackish yellow and things like that over time. Exactly. So that holds no water for me. Uh, in fact, our police officers now at home and most forces have body worn cameras so that when they're going into a scene, because it's not just about looking at the victim and what injuries they have. And that's the first thing that people say, what are your physical injuries? It's not just about the physical injuries on the victim. It's also we're well, looking the house. Yeah, we're things she smashed. Says the phone was ripped out of the wall. Right. Was it? Who took the pictures of that trailer? Because I'm sure there would have been corroborating evidence. Right. There. And another thing, she said it was ripped out of the wall. She said the phone didn't work. She didn't stop there. She said he ripped it out of the wall. Again, 
It has to do with spatial relationships. It has to do with action. These words are the kinds of things we see in very in truthful statements. So it, again, that's a, a corroborating thing. And the police should have go, taken them back to the trailer and, and looked and see if things were smashed. She got thrown against the wall. Maybe the wall smashed in. You know, furniture upended. Right. All these things that tend to be missed. They must have thought it was serious enough to to arrest him. And of course, you know, the interviewer says, "Well, he denied it." Well, if I had a pound for every time a perpetrator denied, you know, domestic abuse is about power and control. It's about that dynamic. And perpetrators don't just switch it off when they interact with law enforcement. And he's going to hold tight of a story. But certainly her account of these individual incidents, um, even when she's asked, and did you see him be violent to anybody else? And she says, you know, and thinks about it, says no. She doesn't try and make up a a number of incidents that she may have seen just to corroborate what she's saying. She actually says no. Right. But what's interesting is she then goes on to describe a number of other incidents where either she is threatened, or her mum and her daughter is threatened, or where other people are threatened. So by you, Stephen by Avery. By Stephen Avery. Right. So even though she says she haven't, hasn't seen him being violent, she's seen that power and control being exerted through threats of violence. And so that's a really important corroborating point as well. And that she's not trying to over-embellish or extend. Right. You and know, she that's... does that several times, and I've noted them, uh, we'll get to them as we get along, but she does that several times. She's given an opportunity to say bad things about him, and she says no. Because that's, again, an All indicator... All she's telling the truth. Yes. So um, then she was asked by the interviewer why... Um, why she cooperated with the documentary at all. And she said, I asked Lori and Moira not to use me at all. Um, I told them it was all lies. Um, and the parts about him, her saying nice things about Stephen Avery. They had called her and asked her to do another interview. And she refused that. Um, and, and she was asked why. And she said, Stephen called and threatened me. He said, I'd pay. And by that, she meant that she thought he would beat her, and that was enough of a threat. Hello, it's Jim Clementi and Francie Hakes with a special message about a new show that I'm hosting on Wondery called Locked Up Abroad. In each episode, people tell their harrowing stories of being convicted of crimes and jailed in foreign lands, or kidnapped and held hostage in war-torn countries. These are definitely worst-case, worst-case scenarios. They're truly frightening situations. Yes. No best cases here. But it is fascinating to hear how they managed to survive these ordeals. In the first episode, Midnight Express, Billy Hayes tells us about being imprisoned in Turkey for smuggling hashish. Oliver Stone even made a movie about it. But that was the movie. This is the real story. I haven't had the chance to interview Billy Hayes recently, and he told me the whole story behind the story of how he escaped a Turkish prison. He even told me that he went back to Turkey years later. You have to hear his story to believe it. And now, in his own words, here is Billy Hayes. And that's the important thing, that, you know, credible abusers don't have to physically be violent all of the time. They can just say things, and that can keep somebody in situ. So the discussion that the interviewer keeps coming back to, and, you know, I thought it was very interesting. The interviewer did their job of keep going back over ground, but asking questions in a different way. But Jodie was consistent at each time she was asked, right. which she, is another important right. point exactly. around her credibility. It was, it was a good sort of interview slash interrogation because she went back over things to check again a second and third time to see if she was consistent. And consistently, she never went overboard. She didn't say he pulled a gun on me, he tried, he said he was going to shoot me, he was going to stab me, he was going to cut my head off. He, she didn't elaborate or, excuse me, um, exaggerate what the kinds of threats that he made against her. And she said, for example, that uh, when she was asked, well, in the documentary, you were seen holding hands, smiling, defending Stephen. How can you explain that? And she said, it was all an act. He told me how to act, and I didn't want to get hurt. I mean, it's very plain English, very direct. It's not, um, well, uh, uh, it, she was... It's a simple account. Yeah, it is. Very simple. You're right. And, and that's what struck me about it. It's so simplistic that she's not trying to fill in gaps. She's not trying to persuade people of her version. And even at the end, she just says, well, it's the truth. Other people saw me with fat lips. Other people know 
deep down in their heart of hearts, and I genuinely believe that other people did see that she had bruises, not just the probation officer, but at the time where you still think that this individual who is controlling you, who could be uh, physically violent to you, may come out on bail or may not end up being locked up, that's enough for her not to say anything to law enforcement. And, you know, I've seen plenty of times where law enforcement do try and, and it's a tactic that I've trained police on to use women who are abused as informants because they actually can tell us a lot of intelligence and information about people who are criminals and perpetrators. And probably law enforcement were asking her and trying to ensure that she answered the questions because they knew that he had been abusive. She had been calling them for help and that's why people call 911 because mm -hmm. they are that terrified. But she doesn't want to continue speaking to the police because also the impact it's having on her in prison, you know, she's still in prison and she's fearful that if she's talking to them, that when she comes out and he's still out, that's going to be a problem. Right. So when people say, but why didn't she say all of this earlier? Or why didn't she tell the documentary makers? You know, when the interviewer yeah. says, did you tell them? Well, victims don't just sit there and disclose, oh, by the way, I'm a victim of domestic violence and this is what's happening to me. You know, they're weighing up things all the time, and this was all about her safety and keeping herself safe. Which... And isn't it also a lot of the a lot of the women in that world were abused? I mean, it's it was almost normal for all of his brothers to be abusing. I mean, it's just like pervasive. They all had, a history, they all had so it gets these normalized, secrets, yes. right? That's yeah. you know, you say that normalized, right? It becomes a norm, and this isn't a norm. You know, all yeah. brothers having a history of domestic violence where actually being abusive to women is just part of everyday life. It's mm. absolutely not, and it shouldn't be tolerated. Of course, yeah. But for Jodie, she was just one of a number of women who were being abused, but she was fearful, and she kept quiet. She did the things Stephen told her to do. Right. And the other thing is that this was all around her addiction to alcohol, too. It started with that. Mm -hmm. It got her into the problem. And I would believe that during the course of the problem, it was where she went to for solace. Her coping mechanism. Yes. Absolutely, to blot things out. And again, people judge her on that. But people do self-medicate alcohol and drugs to block things out. And right. that's where the addiction comes from, to cope with their everyday life. Right. He had a problem with her doing that. And, of course, you know, she gives an account that the day Teresa is murdered is a day that she's meant to be coming out for a drinking class and Stephen's meant to be picking her up right. and the prison don't allow her to come out. And she holds herself responsible. And listening to her give that account is authentic mm. to me. Yeah. It's a genuine, she feels responsibility that had she been out, then Teresa Halbeck would not have been killed on that day because she would have been at the property and therefore it would have changed things. Yeah. She and went through intensive counselling. Yeah. I mean, no one does that without genuine and good reason. She said, if they would have let me out, she'd still be alive. And at this point, she breaks down. And she said, because I would have been there. Mm -hmm. And it just, it seemed to be spontaneous. It seemed to be le totally legitimate tears. I mean, it wasn't, it didn't at all seem to be something that she, mm -hmm. crocodile tears that she put on mm -hmm. for the camera. She was, she literally, her face reddened and scrunched up and she became emo very emotional about it. It was clear that she felt very present grief and guilt still totally at that point. Totally responsible for, yeah. for When what she went said on. that, um, it's almost like, uh, because I would have been there because I would have been the one he would be beating on and, yes. and uh, you know, I would have been in, in her There's place. She, yes, and she didn't vocalize that, but mm -hmm. that's some of the nonverbal communication yeah. that seemed to be going on right then, yeah. You could see it was in her head. Yeah, because the, the interviewer actually said, well, what could you have done to stop it? And she had to think for a minute, and I think that's what was going through her mind. Uh, he would have been beating on me and raping me <laughs> instead of doing that to this girl. Yeah. I mean, eating rat poison, which is what she says, you know, she ate boxes of rat poison as, as a cry for help, is a very severe thing to do to, to show that there is a problem. And if each time, you know, the police and others aren't taking it seriously and it's the three days, no contact or, you know, she's being put back into that situation, that's how she sees it, then there's no escape. It's for pretty it. hopeless. But it is. It's, again, present time corroboration of the abuse that's going on. While, during the time she's making these reports to the police about him abusing her, she's also self-harming at the same time to try to get away from the situation for a period of time, and nobody actually follows through. But there is one time 
I'd say in this whole interview that I did question what she was saying. And that's when she was talking about she had called Stephen at 536 on the night of the murder. And during that conversation, she in the in the documentary, she said the conversation was normal. And if he had been doing anything, then that wouldn't have happened. And we wouldn't have talked for 15 minutes. So that was what was in the documentary. And so she during the questioning of her about that it was the only question that we saw anyway in this tape where she said, could you repeat that? She had that's the kind of thing that somebody does when they're when they, they have to think about the answer. So that's just one indicator. And um, she said at the end, she kind of threw in, well, he did fa- sound funny, like he was hiding something. And that was the only thing throughout this whole conversation where I thought her behavior and her verbal and nonverbal indicators told me that she may not be telling the truth in this in this particular part. What did you think, Laura? Well, you know, I think it was a very long time ago uh, when she said she didn't watch the documentary and there was a lot of information contained in what the interviewer said about that particular section of, of the phone call. So, yes, I mean, I read it that she was playing for a bit of time. You know, she wasn't really sure what to say. And again, it tells me that she hasn't gone into this interview totally prepared, mm-hmm. anticipating questions, ready with an answer that's really nice and polished. For me, it sounds like a genuine reflection that at the time she said these things, yes, I probably did say that. But actually, when she reflects back on it, maybe it wasn't quite as he did sound like he was hiding something. But who knows? I mean, that, you know, I, I do think that when you get such a time distance between what was said, if someone asked me what I said eight or nine years ago, I, I may, and it's a direct quote, and it's quite long, you may ask them to repeat it. As I said right at the start, start of this, people can tell the truth about a lot of things that have one lie in the middle oh, or one dissembling in the middle or one evasive comment in the middle and or one or dozens of them. But we, we look at the, the information that's being conveyed when they're giving these deceptive or truthful behavioral clues or verbal or nonverbal clues. Mm. I mean, I, I don't think she's especially intelligent and bright and she's not pre-prepared. And that, for me, the fact she's not pre-prepared, she hasn't got all the answers, that she's anticipating every question. And the fact that she does ask for things to be repeated and she doesn't try and overextend or embellish, these are all things that tell me it's a genuine... She's being put on the spot. She's going to be asked all these questions. She's not there to persuade people of her version of events. That's how it felt to me. You know, and right at the end, you, I'm not here to, you know, do anything other than tell the truth. Mm-hmm. And there will be people who call me a liar. And I, I do think that it's an interesting time for her to disclose because there has been sort of a groundswell of support for Stephen Avery And, you know, she does risk being labelled a liar and the family calling her a liar and people vilifying her. But she comes out to say what she believes is her truth. And there are people who can corroborate her truth. And there are former partners who can corroborate that truth too. Do you think she really hasn't seen the documentary? I think that there's a very good chance that she hasn't. And the it's ten the hours thing, long, by the way. Her, it's not really? something that everybody can just see. <laughs> yeah, it's not like you, you can see it in fifteen it, minutes. I mean, I don't but know. Her saying she just wants distance from it. I know a lot of victims. If who it represented a nightmare, distance, mm-hmm. okay. the trauma and the chaos, they don't want to keep reliving it. So actually, that sounds viable to me. That does sound very credible. And certain things we bury when we've had trauma and crisis. And it's our body and our brain's way of dealing with that. And we don't want to revisit it and repeat it. And here she is having to. Well, plus, if she had seen the documentary, she would have been better prepared to answer that question about the 536 call. Because remember, that was a very pivotal point in the documentary where everybody thought, well, you know, if he did it, how could he be on the phone with her based on she's sitting there looking at the phone bill saying it was a 15 minute call. We would never have been on the phone for 15 minutes if something was going on, Mm -hmm. if he was doing something wrong at the time. But she was going to, she did say she was subpoenaed by the prosecution. And I, I think that's interesting. They didn't use her in the end, but I'm sure they would have been looking for things around bad character. Um, in in terms of why they would use her. But she does make it clear that she felt that Brendan was coerced by Stephen Avery. And she does talk about this Jekyll and Hyde 
type yeah. character. And I do see that often in cases, this Jekyll and Hyde behind closed doors and what you see on the surface being two different things. And, you know, she's asked about letters that Stephen Avery has even sent her post-conviction. One of them she's read, and they're just more threatening letters. Which Have you read that? Have you seen that letter? I haven't seen all... No, I haven't seen all of them. I, well, I happened to four. look at it today. Um, and it... <laughs> I mean, it's written in a way you're just like, wow, he's these, these completely not educated, obviously, and it's full of declarative, you know, exclamation points and this and that, and... Uh, it is threatening in some ways. Some of it is asking for money for his mother. Like, you need to pay my mom back this money. You need to give me back this, this and that. But there's an incredible amount of accusing her of, you know, sleeping with Barb's husband and, you know, lots lots of people on the property. Uh, it was just, it was, it's interesting to read it. Mm. I mean, she says that he threatened her and wanted money and that he right. was threatening her that he was going to tell people she was driving yeah, was and drinking yeah. and didn't mm -hmm. you know shouldn't be drinking with her without a license or driving right. without a license I should say mm -hmm. so he was using the tools that he's used in the past which are her Achilles heel um, you know and again we see those tactics used by abusers of using every vulnerability that a victim has to try and you know that tentacle of control trying to le get some leverage and get that person back in check so she also said that he said to her, yeah, they, the, the interviewer asked her, um, do you think he's guilty and why? And she said that he, that Stephen said to her, all bitches owe me because of the one that sent him to prison the first time. And then she said something very revealing after that, that we all owed him. So she was, she was putting herself in that category. I mean, I'm sorry to use the words, but you know, that she was in the category of bitches. Mm -hmm. You know, she accepted that. That, to me, sounds like somebody who's been domestically abused. Mm -hmm. In other words, she doesn't say he was talking about somebody else. He was talking about me and other women. He, she doesn't correct it. Because know. that's how he views women. And actually, he, he is aggrieved in his mind by a number of them. Right. By Penny, who is the original rape victim, by uh, Judy... Davarak, who was the original person who said it's Stephen Avery, by Laurie, who goes off with uh, his nephew's father. Uh, so you've got Laurie, then you've got Jodie. And so these grievances against women are stacking up, you know, and this constant uh, concern or micro-checking of her behaviour about having affairs, um, you know, it's seems very, to thread the whole yeah. way through their relationship. It's very indicative of the coercive control that you see in domestic violence relationships. And she was asked why she didn't tell the police, and she said she didn't tell the police because she thought he'd get out on bail. And she didn't want to say, yeah, he's guilty, and then have him come out on bail and beat her again or who, do worse. Yeah, he would take the brunt of that. And she fully knew that. So that keeps her in check and keeps her controlled. And the only time that she can disclose these things is when she feels safe when there is no control that he or the family have and I do think it's interesting what she says about the brothers um, you know yes we know that domestic violence uh, they all had a history of domestic violence Earl Chuck and Stephen but what was interesting was that Chuck and Earl both thought that he did it right from the start because they all described him as very controlling a, a Jekyll and Hyde character and a monster and subsequently their accounts yeah. seemed to change and right. the family then stuck together. But yeah, the that family the kind original. of circled the wagons and decided we were going, they were all going to stay on the side of Stephen. And I think some of that might have been um, maybe in the hopes of protecting the family name and pr preserving that lawsuit um, that he ended up settling so he could pay for his lawyers. Well, if one of the brothers actually is the real murderer, then of course you would throw suspicion on the brother who already people are biased against, too. Sure, if that was the case, mm -hmm. yeah. And that, of course, is one of his claims that, you know, this was Chuck seeking revenge um, and framing Stephen Avery. But he was always very jealous of Chuck, if you take Jodie's account um, and their relationship, even though Jodie said there was no relationship there at all. But certainly, I mean, Laurie not having anything to do with Stephen Avery, and I think all the children, bar one, have nothing to do with him and say that he belongs in prison. I mean, the people that know him best, you know, not just those who are being loyal to him, but other people, uh, clearly have a strong view that he was very controlling, and if he didn't get what he wants, 
you know, he would enforce it in another way. If he couldn't get it verbally and psychologically, then he would enforce it physically. And that seems to be um, salient coming across the, the significant women in his life and what they report of his behavior towards them. Right. So another point that uh, the investigator, excuse me, the interviewer asked, why did you stop talking to investigators? And she said, because it was hard. I was in jail. And you have to put this in context. She was in jail. And the investigators were coming and taking her out of her cell. And everybody around knows that she's going and talking to these police officers. This is a very difficult thing for a convict to do. Somebody who's in, not a convict, actually. Well, I guess she was, this was a short-term jail sentence, right? This for was drunk, due to her drinking Yeah, driving, drunk driving. Yeah. But she has to go back into cells with other inmates. And it makes it much more difficult to cooperate with the police in any jail setting like that. Because you're always looked at as a rat if you cooperate mm -hmm. with the police when you're in jail. So I, I took that as, as another credible statement. And then later she said, um, I try to block all that out. It's hard. And she almost cried at that point. Um, it was about when she was talking about testifying, uh, why she, the prosecution didn't actually use her in testifying against Stephen. And, and at that point, again, she she almost cried. And, and when she says it's hard, it, it seemed like a genuine conveying of that emotion that th this is all very difficult for me. You're talking about it because you watched a, a TV show. I lived it. This is where mm -hmm. she's coming from. She has the appropriate emotionality when she's talking about these things. And again, to me, that speaks of veracity. When you think back to the footage in the documentary of her when you watched it, if you can think, uh, did you notice anything at all in that behavior? Well, I think the, the part that struck me the most was when they were walking down the sidewalk, mm -hmm. I think maybe to a courthouse, and Stephen was all cleaned up, and he's right. wearing a brand new leather jacket. And, and hair she's was all... frosted blonde, I think. Oh, I, <laughs> I, didn't... Know, I noticed that. <laughs> okay, I didn't notice that part, but <laughs> I believe it. And they're holding hands. Mm -hmm. And they look like a happy couple. But what you have to remember is you're seeing this because there's a camera crew in front of them. All right. She knows this is going to be on TV. Yeah. She knows he has told her, according to her, he has told her to act like everything's great. And he told her not to say anything bad or she would pay. Right. So I think that it's understandable from her point of view why she would act all happy. And she may also have been happy because she was stuck with this guy and he's about to become possibly a big millionaire. So it could have been potentially very happy time for them. And again, this was at a time when there was a lot of positive things going on in his life. In other words, he's meeting with lawmakers and the governor and all this stuff. I mean, he's really become big man on campus there. And so she may have been uh, less taken advantage of at that time. She may have actually, he may not have been as much of a you know, violent person. I don't know. What do you think, Laura? Well, when I think back to the original footage, you know, because obviously this, disclosure, this sorry, disclosure came later, the only thing that jumped out at me, because I do think that she put on a good show, okay, and I see this all the time, mm. so I don't ever take at face value just something that I see. You know, I've seen perpetrators who are very incredibly controlling look like they are very caring and very loving for someone, of just going up, putting a jacket around someone's shoulders, or but it can be a hidden message, you know. It looked like pseudo-caring behaviour, but actually what he's saying is you're showing too much flesh and covering someone up. So I have seen people to the outside world convey one thing where actually what's going on behind closed doors is very different. But there was a nuanced detail I picked up on, which was when she was on that phone call <laughs> and he says at the end, I love you, she does not reciprocate. Now, normally you would expect reciprocation of, you know, there's a camera crew there, etc., and she's putting on this... Uh, you know, we're happy and, and things are going great, but she did not reciprocate and return the I love you. Mm -hmm. So that was the only question mark that I had at the time. Why didn't she say I love you? I, I never felt she was really in the relationship. I didn't really see her in it um, and talking from the heart, but that could have been for many reasons. Mm -hmm. It could have been she's shy being on camera. It could be because she's got a drink problem, that she's kind of embarrassed about all of that being aired. It could be, you know, that she's just going through an in enormously difficult time in her life. And, or it could be she's just not an emotional person. And I had no baseline of her to say anything else 
other than seeing this particular interview and her saying, I was never in love with Stephen Avery. It took me straight back to what I heard when she was on that original phone call when she didn't reciprocate. And that seemed to be salient again that she didn't love him. And there were other things that were keeping her in the relationship. Um, like I say, abusers are not abusive all of the time. There must have been some good things, and I'm sure there were more than two occasions where things were good. You know, I wasn't sure about where she said the two times, or equally the other question that I had was when she, when she was asked the question, was there any strain between him and the police department? Well, I would have expected there would be some from the previous history, but also from him being arrested. Right, I noticed that too. Yeah, yeah I didn't, that, that didn't quite tally, but it, it's no big deal from my perspective, yeah. because all the other behavioural things, uh, you know, made sense. And her talking effectively about a number of high risk factors. And that's what I was ticking them off as. High risk factors of serious harm and homicide from the strangulation and choking, the coercively controlling behaviour and the excessive jealous behaviour are high risk factors. Stalking in a relationship is high risk factor. And stalking her post relationship when she's trying to separate. Victim's fear, whirlwind relationship and escalation. She didn't convey it in those terms, but if I was risk assessing her, I would be concerned about her welfare. Yeah, and she describes him as the one person I don't trust. He's like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. The inter interviewer asks in what way, and he's, she said, well, some of the times he's the nicest guy, and another, other times he's a monster. And I think that was very eloquently put, mm -hmm. and I think that describes what Laura just described in, in all the cases that she's worked in many of the cases that she's worked, that's how the offender presents themselves in a way that looks like a nice guy, but actually there's a lot of controlling behavior and negative and violent behavior and threats, uh, unstated, but still there. Um, uh, threats. I didn't mention threats to kill, which, again, high risk behavior, yes. you know, to control. And, you know, having created a risk assessment model that all the UK use, UK law enforcement, that is, um, England, Wales, Northern Ireland and, and Scotland use it. It's 27 questions that when a victim discloses uh, that the police ask and she would score highly on that risk assessment. But the other point just to cover off is that, you know, certainly just because he's guilty of domestic violence and domestic abuse, that doesn't mean to say that he is guilty of murder. But this is relevant and it is important. Unlike one of the defence barristers when we were on, or defence lawyers, on Dr Drew, who immediately said, you know, she's insane, she's an alcohol user, she's discredited right from the start, she's mad. You know, all these things that actually are used every day um, in court or we hear people talk about it as a way to discredit a victim. But they're all things that can happen as a consequence of abuse, as mm -hmm. Jim said, as a coping mechanism. So it certainly is uh, relevant and it shows his, it's a, it's a window into his objectification of women. You bitches, you all owe me. You know, if he treats the people that he's meant to care and love and look after, uh, the people that he's meant to care about the most in the world, or, you know, the best in the world, I should say, what's he prepared to do to someone that he doesn't know? You know, a female that rejects him, that he feels angered about women and... He makes an advance to a woman and he wants her to reciprocate that because Jodie hasn't come out that day. Mm. It, it's a big question mark. And the fact that he strangles and chokes both Laurie and also um, Jodie, you know, strangulation is one of the uh, most common methods used to kill women in domestic violence situations. And I know we're going to come on to what happened to Teresa Halbeck, mm. but people keep asking the question, you know, well, there's loads of blood. Well, who says there's loads of blood? That's, that's an assumption based on one story. And yeah. we're going to get into yeah, okay. what, that, what that story is. But a couple of other things that I wanted to mention about this, about this interview. Um, I, and, and to be fair, the, the other indication of deception that I saw was, and there were only two of them in this, in this interview, but where she said she was asked about the letters, the four letters that Steve Avery wrote her, and she said, never read them. And then she said, I read one of them. Yeah. So she corrected herself right away. So when she said never read them, uh, you know, to me, that that was... An alarm bell went off yes, for me too. Yeah, but then but she, then she correct. immediately corrected herself and said, I read one of them. So that just um, because I want this to be balanced. Right. So, um, but... Um, 
she said that Stephen told me to make him look good in terms of during the documentary filming. And he, at times, she said, uh, the, some of the threats that he had said to her over time was he told me he'd burned down my mom's house with them in it and my daughter in it. Um, and then she was asked about a couple of police reports. And we talked about, in one case, it was break time. She was out sitting in the car with him. And there was a bunch of guys there. And he asked, Steve Avery asked her, what are those guys, which ones of those guys are you talking to? And she said, I'm not talking to any of them. And he got loud, so I got out of the car. Then he got out of the car, and he was screaming at me. And the guys started coming over to, to see what was wrong, to see if there's a problem. That was, you know, another situation where he was trying to exert control over well, he these. He threatens to kill them, doesn't right. he? He said he'd come back with a shotgun. Right. I'm gonna come I'm gonna I'm gonna come down there and kill you. This is how he responds to things, all right? So it's the jealousy, it's the lack of control. If he doesn't have control, then he threatens murder. Poor impulse control, and that's witnessed by other people. And that's why it's interesting when she asks about his, has he been violent to other people? He clearly uses violence, and it's how you understand violence. You know, some people think violence is just about physical, but it's about threats, and it's about coercion, and it's about psychological and emotional. But here's somebody who will go up to a group of guys and threaten to harm them too because right. they're talking to his girlfriend, his fiancée. Right. And, and, and they, they were coming to rescue her from his violent rages at the, at the time, or at least loud rages. So, and then the other report that, that she was asked about was when she was pushed, punched, choked to unconsciousness, dragged out of the, cow, ca, ca, excuse me, dragged out of the house to the car, then they were stopped by the police. And again, that's the one where they said there's no physical evidence of you being choked, but again, they didn't wait for the bruises to actually appear. And it must have been, there must have been a believable component because they arrested Stephen at that time. Um, and she was asked about why she thought he was guilty. And she said, and I thought this was, again, another, another um, other century information where she said, as soon as I saw it on TV because I was in jail, something in my gut told me he was guilty. And again, that kind of information, that kind of sensory information where you're saying I had a gut feeling is a Again, an indicator. Basing statements on that kind of information, that's an indicator of veracity. Um, they, he was then asked, um, she was then asked, excuse me, about Charles Avery, Chuck, and his history of violence with women. And she said, Stephen thought that me and Chuck had something going on because Stephen was jealous. And I was not allowed to talk to him, so I did what I was told. Again. Mm -hmm. An indicator that she is being controlled by Stephen. Mm -hmm. And all of this cross-corroborates itself. This is a history that's documented at the time with police reports and, and, and all sorts of sensory data tell me that this is a truthful report. And again, it doesn't mean that because he was domestically violent that he's definitely a killer, but it is certainly consistent behavior mm -hmm. with, with saying that bitches owe me. Right. Again, I apologize for the statement, but using that word. But the fact is that that is consistent with his stated intention to take what he wanted from women. And his entitlement and his threatening nature. Right. And I believe that he intended to have a sexual encounter with Teresa on that day. And when she tried to fight him off, he ended up killing her. When she talks about telling the documentarians that she doesn't want to be in it anymore. So she's very detailed about the documentarians, you know, I told them this, I told them that I didn't want to be in it. And then the interviewer says, well, what did they say to you? And she's like, oh, I don't remember, <laughs> you know. Okay, but and, you know what? That mm -hmm. is actually an indicator of veracity. Mm -hmm. The fact is, no, when you're being asked specific language that was used in a conversation eight or nine years ago, if you said, this is what they said and this is what I said, unless that is a very traumatic event in your life, then if you said those words, I would say you're lying. Because it's impossible to know, to remember with specificity what words somebody says no, in a yeah, conversation. No, but not just the words, but just did they agree or say, no, I'm sorry, we're But that's gonna... not what she was asked. She's, yes, her, what... No, she's a very literal person. And she was asked specifically, what did they say to you? And she said, you know, it was so long ago, I don't remember. So I, I know what you're saying, and, and again, in that situation, though, people, I mean, all She's I can say is... She's not looking to fudge it or to make up 
anything, you know, she's talking about thinking back to eight or nine years ago, of mm -hmm. what exactly did they say? And she's taking that very literally. And I, I genuinely think, you know, at the time she did sign up and she would have signed a disclosure, right, to right. be in this show. But afterwards, she's then saying when they want the next interview, right. actually, now I'm away and I'm safe. I don't want to be in this. I don't want to either give you a new interview and I actually don't want you to use any of the footage. But, of course, she's signed that away already. Right. Well, the filmmakers That's... have gone on record because they did watch the interview and, and, you know, they don't want to throw her under any buses or, you know, cause her any pain. But they do say that is absolutely not the case, that they contacted her for a you know post-interview because they've been following this for years and years and she declined being further interviewed but that she never said take me out. I mean, how, if, how would she know what is even going to be used? You know, she doesn't know what footage that they're going to use. She hasn't you don't seen necessarily it. need to know that. No, that's fine. But I, I'm just saying that they have said that she did not say that. So that, she, that is what it but, is. But how is that consistent? If she said, no, I'm not going to be interviewed again, that's yeah. consistent with saying, don't use me. But saying, yeah, go ahead and use what I did before, but I'm not going to do it again, yeah, that's that, inconsistent. It's not con inconsistent with filmmaking at all. I mean, well, no, it's, it's just well, not... Well, from a filmmaker's point mm -hmm. of view, but for, from the, the point of view of a subject who was in that film, mm -hmm. if she said, look, uh, no, I don't want to do another... If she was just looking for publicity, mm -hmm. she, why wouldn't she do another interview? Right. She would do another interview, but she's saying no, because I want to... Publicity. I know, but yeah. other no, people are. Yeah. It yeah, but what I'm saying is, but if she doesn't want... Now she's actually moved on, cleaned herself up, moved on with her life, and now they're asking her, please do another interview. And she said, no, I don't want to do another. That indicates a break from what was done in that documentary. And so I'm saying that is consistent with also saying, don't use the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know legally whether if she says don't use the rest of it, that they would have, they would be compelled to take it out or whether they could still use it because she's, signed I mean, does it, it say, sign the disclosure? Does, and... you can withdraw this consent at any time? I doubt it, but it's possible. But either way, the fact is that they, they have, they have as much of a reason to say she didn't say that sure, as she has a reason to say it. So of course. it'd be interesting to know though, if they had talked to her again, would this information have come out, the interview that she gave, you know, the, the, the information that she gave? Well, to... if they were doing it in a completely neutral and um, th uh, therapeutic way, maybe it would have. But if they did it in a way, well, you know, we're trying to show that Steve is actually, like, he's gotten the raw deal yeah, here. Yeah, okay. I'm not, I don't think that that's what um, they... Well, we, you we don't, but we let's don't talk know. about it. Let's no, talk sure, about let's it. Let's talk about it. Let's okay. go. Let's go, Clemente. <laughs> I, no, go ahead. I mean... <laughs> no, I mean, I, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about this since we've been talking about this subject, and I've, you know, read a lot of what Demos and Ricciardi have said, and, you know, they don't say that he's innocent at all. They're just, they were following the justice system. They were, they were following what the two parties were doing in the legal system. And, and, of course, they were following the immediate family, you know, around Stephen, which... Which is important because their access is through right. the Avery family, not mm -hmm. through the Halbeck family. Or, right, who important. have no obligation to talk to them at all. You know, Halbecks right. absolutely don't. Well, I mean, just there are going to be a million perspectives from on this story from every single angle. That doesn't negate what the mother went through. That doesn't negate what Sure, anything, that's a compelling you know. story, and I felt for her. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of felt for the father, too, um, you know, when he's pulling off leaves of lettuce and eating the bugs and all at the end. I mean, he's a, he's a human being. And yeah, he has a terrible record, too, by the way. Well, <laughs> I mean, he's I'm sure got, he does, yeah. but that's what I was going to say. But mm -hmm. he has, you know, he, these are, this is his son. This is somebody he wants to protect. He wants to believe he's innocent. He, he, he probably was looking forward to $36 million or, or a split of it at some point. I mean, of course, it would have changed their lives completely. But back all, the, all that out, all, what I'm saying is the documentary itself had a theme. And it came out in a way that made it look like, I mean, because Steve Avery was definitely wrongfully convicted by these people, by the actions of these police officers and this prosecutor, that it made it look like it just might have happened again, mm -hmm. as opposed to being uh, what what in all of the information that's come out after it, there is none of that information that tells me that Steve Avery is actually innocent. 
a lot of the information that wasn't put in there tends to prove that he's guilty. And so it, there's things that they they had to choose. Well, of course. I mean, you have 700 hours right, of trial and f- footage, and they say they included what was the, the strongest case that the that the prosecutors had against him. That's, that's just not that's true. That's what they, but that they included. But any documentarian, I'm sitting down with a number of them at the moment, you have to tell the material to them, but then they start to create the script and they want to make sure of, of those choices, of what they're putting in. And I think... I found myself, I'm going to use myself in this, that they were giving me information to make certain conclusions at certain times, Mm. and I found myself falling into that. Mm. So whichever way you slice it, they have to make decisions about what they're going to use. Yeah, of course. They definitely had a flavour that this was happening a second time over, and my sense of outrage was absolutely there by the time I'd finished. It was only when I went back, looked at my notes, checked some of the things that I'd written that I started to see there was another set of things that I needed to consider and that actually these things had been left out for whatever reason, but they had been left out. And whoever you get access to, I mean, I've given Mm -hmm. and done lots of documentaries with bereaved families Mm -hmm. of homicide. When you're in their home and when you're with them, the lion's share of the time, you can start to feel yourself seeing something from a perspective. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's a human being element that you get drawn in by the emotion of things. And, you know, afterwards, after the fact, they can say, oh, we came at this from a very, uh, you know, objective point of view. But I personally don't think that they did. I mm. think it's... We'll it, have to, we'll have to disagree. Be, well, my well, yeah, but let me... They just make conclusions. And right. those conclusions well, are Well, I think that they, they have not very the well uh, shown true breakdowns in this investigation. I mean, there's no denying that. Yeah, there's no that. question yeah. about that, and that's but all I, it's that's... the evidence that's left out. The yeah. handcuffs and leg irons that were found okay. in Steve Avery. No, don't let, let, wait. Uh, let me finish. Okay. Handcuffs and leg irons found in Steve Avery's trailer, trailer mm-hmm. which he admitted were his, and yeah. he said he used them in sex play. Right, that he bought with his sister, who also bought leg irons for use with her husband. I mean, this, yeah. Okay, that's right. but what are you saying? No, I'm Does just, that take yeah. away the fact that they actually found them? Why didn't they put that in the documentary? They had it. They had the information. They didn't. They chose not, not to put to it in. It. That's important. Okay. Um, was that used in the trial? No, it was not. Oh, I don't know if it was used in the okay, trial. No, well, I'm saying it wasn't in the documentary. Right, but we don't know if it was used as evidence in the trial, right? I, I don't that, know. But, okay. But that, wait, but yeah. but st- the documentary isn't about the trial. The documentary yeah, is about the entire case. No, right, right, it wasn't right. limited. Mm-hmm. They certainly put things in the documentary mm-hmm. that were not in the trial. And then Brendan got, had huge bleed, bleed stage on his jeans, and he told his mother that he got those mm-hmm. on his jeans because he was helping Stephen clean up the floor of the garage. Uh-huh. That wasn't in the documentary. Uh, yes, it was, because I remember hearing that in the documentary. Yes, when? I absolutely I'm, remember that. I'm not sure that was in the documentary. Yeah. I, I, I listed it as the evidence left out, but if I I'm wrong... It, I heard it I'm, on the interview with Brendan Dassey that wasn't in the yes. in this show. Well. Right. I didn't hear any of that, so... But we've okay. talked about it, you mm-hmm. see, since. They didn't They didn't put in that Jody did not want to do another interview at the end. Mm. Um, that that in 2006, the Associated Press had done, a, had done an interview of a cellmate of Stephen Avery's, and he said that Stephen Avery's admitted to and drew out a plan to torture a woman. Um, you talked about a torture chamber. That... That in 2004 that he was being investigated for child sexual abuse of his right, niece. So um, mm-hmm. And... They didn't include Laurie, which, you know, even on the basis that he had a history of domestic violence reported to police, because they try and make it look like they're being up front right from the start about the cat, that's, that's what I instantly bought into. They're putting the stuff up front. Mm-hmm. Did she want to talk? I mean, did she... Want to talk to she them? Didn't Did she... need to even speak to them. I mean, they could have just said it's a public record about what his history is. I don't know whether they even approached right, her. Right, so we don't know if they approached her. No, and but she Laurie declined. just dropped out of the documentary. And what's interesting is when you Google her, mm-hmm. even if you just open source intelligence, her there's a whole history there mm-hmm. around her, around the children, and around the brothers. So it's just to say, if you're giving a balanced documentary i would have liked to have heard some of these other things they as did well. show his letters to her saying that i'm going to kill you and 
they, they showed yeah, that. Yeah, I remember, remember seeing that, but I mm-hmm. don't remember seeing that she went to a refuge, to a mm-hmm. shelter. That tells me that things are... she made at police such, reports. Yeah, she'd made police reports. Things are at such a tipping point. When someone goes into a refuge, they do not do it lightly. They do it because mm-hmm. they are fearful for their mm-hmm. lives. You know, and, and the children not wanting to see him. Th- these are just things that you can just throw out off the top of your head that mm-hmm. if you do a balanced review of it, you would like to have knowledge of that and then you can make the decision because that's kind of what the show is all about, isn't it? Mm. We're we're kind of showing you all these things, you can make a decision. But I think some of these big omissions um, tend to give quite a myopic view of what's going on. And afterwards, you know, Jim and I have both spent a lot of time researching all the other material that's out there that they could have chosen Okay, Jodie's interview came later in terms of her disclosure, but there's lots of other material that they could have chosen too, which they made a conscious choice not to. Right, and and I'm not blaming them for doing that. What I'm saying is they produced an amazingly compelling documentary, a piece of entertainment, and that was their job. But to say that they did a completely balanced job on what the actual facts were... I would say that's not what this documentary was. That's all. And that is, if they had done it, maybe it wouldn't have been the huge success that it is. I think it has really created a hell of a lot of dialogue. Yeah. I mean, the reason why we're talking right now is because of the momentous event that it created in, in the world, not just of entertainment. But it has spurred on a lot of important discussion about mm-hmm. what the police and the prosecutor did in this case. And I think that's compelling. That's about the justice system. And whether he killed her or not, Mm -hmm. this is something that needs to be rectified. And I think in the the wash of all this are Theresa Holbach's family, Mm -hmm. um, the the former girlfriends and wives of Stephen Avery, and Brendan Dassey. I think they've all been victims of this, of this guy. And I think there's no, um, there's no, lack of benefit. In other words, there is a direct benefit to all those people because we're having this discussion now. And so of course, we can all have the discussion and then we go home. You know, for them, this is their lives. This is real life that we're sort of discussing as if it doesn't really have any consequence. And of course it does. And you could see that etched across Jodie's face. And of course, the Halbecks family, those who are having to, to relive this because we are all discussing it so I have a huge amount of empathy for them because these are real life cases and these are real life people that it's great to have the discussion about for me this is the bigger picture the system Um, I think we all agree that um, the fair trial did not ever happen and whether that can happen now even so you know he has a good defense counsel who's uh, got a Twitter handle and calls herself, you know, unmaking, yeah. unmaking murderers, yeah, um, yeah. which is a whole nother show probably yeah. on its own. Yeah. And and just uh, just to wrap up this mm-hmm. topic that we're talking about, which was mm-hmm. Jody's interview, right. um, there's one final thing that I, I wanted to talk about. Um, when she was asked, when Jody was asked by the interviewer, what about the family? They're going to say you're and others are going to say you're lying. Mm-hmm. And she said, well, that doesn't matter because deep down they know it's true. Mm. They've seen the fat lips and the bruises. This is the kind of thing that, to me, sort of sums up everything that she was saying. Why is she giving this interview now? Some people think it's because she wants fame and fortune or something out of it. But actually, these are like, these are, are declarations against her interest. In other words, if she has really moved on with her life, this is sort of dredging up a really bad period of her her life. And she says she wants to get the truth out. She's doing it even though people are going to hate her, even though people are going to call her a liar, even though people are going to vilify her, because that is actually what's been happening. Some people have been doing that, and they're very vocal about it. But she said the people that matter most, the family, knows that what she's saying is true, and that's why she's doing it. So I just want to share with you, I mean, as you say, Laura, you know, there are real lives going on here. And actually, you know, audiences watching this, you know, they have real events like this in their lives. And so I was in a relationship with somebody who was abusive and uh, an alcoholic and very charming on the outside. You know, everybody loved him. And and he'd come home at night 
accusing me of all kinds of things, waking me up in the middle of the night and breaking everything around me, but not me, you know. But still so, isn't that a threat Yeah, to exactly. You? And threatening to kill himself, not me, you know. And I didn't, so I'm watching Jody, you know, wanting, you know, not doubting at all her abuse story and all that stuff. And, and in fact, I remember calling a hotline, you know, emergency hotline and saying, you know, what should I do? You know, my boyfriend, he's, he's breaking everything. I'm afraid he's going to hurt himself. And she's like, well, you have to leave. And I was like, well, no, he's not hitting me. And she's like, well, not yet. Mm -hmm. It's only a matter of time. I mean, the way she had the tone in her voice was just so resigned. And I just, you know, I did not want to hear that at all. Um, you know, and finally I did leave. But, you know, so I, you know, I'm watching Jody, and I'm, I believe the story of the beatings and the abuse, but there's just something for me that's that's missing from the story. I mean, where is her daughter and all this? Where is, I don't know. There's Apparently something she, else. the daughter was living with her, her parents, her mother at least, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, firstly, I'm sorry to hear that, Lisa, mm -hmm. you know, about your own experience, mm -hmm. but it's so, uh, you know, prevalent in the yeah. sense that we're talking about one in three women who experience yeah. this. So yeah. when people say these women over here mm -hmm. or, you know, when men are abused too, because they can be can be male victims, these men over here, we're actually talking about us in a room because it will mm -hmm. affect one in three. Right. Um, you know, and the truth of that call is that the call handler would have heard it all before and she was absolutely right because people who damage things around the person inevitably when they feel that they are not in control anymore will damage that person too but it's the hardest question to ask someone because many victims at that time are not ready to leave and they have to find the time mm -hmm. and the space and get the respite and have the support from paladin my service and women's aid and refuge and all the great specialist services that are out there to give them the information that they need and to help them risk manage and safety plan to leave safely. And we're going to can't just walk out the door, as you right. quite rightly mm -hmm. said. And at the end of this podcast, we will list a couple of resources for women who are, find themselves in that situation or men. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully they will reach out for help because we don't want to see anybody else become a victim. Yeah. No, and thank you for sharing that because it's important that people relate yeah, to thank you. the yeah. subject. It's well, thank not... you for giving me this. You know, it's so funny because I hadn't even really thought of it in a really long time. And just watching again with you guys just now, it brought I was it back like, up. oh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's why I'm, Because sometimes you know. we bury things <laughs> yeah, and we try and put those things in a box and we shut that box because it's a part of our lives we don't want to revisit. And isn't that what Jody as said? As Jody did. In her interview. Yeah. 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 But... We do move on. All right. <laughs> well, uh, we hope that you've uh, gained some insights with our discussion today. This has been very insightful for me, and I hope that we have uh, given you some things to th think about uh, with respect to this case. And I will promise you there will be more. We'll be back talking about other interviews, and we will be covering some of the questions that the listeners have written into us on Twitter or Facebook or on SoundCloud itself. And... Uh, iTunes, I guess. So if you're, uh, if you have specific questions for us, keep them coming and we'll do our best to answer them in a subsequent podcast. Yeah. Please post them on Facebook, Twitter, or a real know. crime profile or at Laura Richards, nine, nine or Jim Clementi, uh, at Jim Clementi on Twitter. So we are really happy. Uh, I mean, just overwhelmed with the response we've That's gotten right. for this podcast. Um, and the number of amazing uh, reviews and comments and so forth, and helpful comments, too, because people are pointing things out. And sometimes when we're doing this, we're covering a lot of ground in one day. We're covering a lot of uh, different facts and circumstances. So sometimes we may... Uh, and in busy schedules. So yes. just come back from... Yeah, the and folks, I get it that I say, yeah, a lot. Okay, heard and received. I'm Italian. It's, just chill. It's, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's one of the things I wanted to say. If you, if you want to think things or whatever, I guess that's your prerogative. But the fact is, don't be rude. Don't be nasty. Just please be a human being. We're trying to be nice to people. We're, trying, we're doing this podcast to inform people so that they can lead better lives and understand things that are happening in the world around them. And please do not pick on anybody. Uh, if you want to hey, pick I can on me, take it. come on, no, 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 perfect. Yeah. Bring it, bring it, you guys. Uh, well, <laughs> it's okay. I don't know if you really want to say that, but um, but please, uh, we appreciate you listening. We appreciate the 
the critical comments and as long as they deal with the subject matter and so forth. But uh, let's keep it um, not personal. Let's keep Thank it real. you. Yeah, let's keep, keep it real. Profile. Real. All right, crime guys. Profile. All right, well, thank you again, and we will be back. For advice or support, if you're experiencing stalking in the UK, you can contact Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service on 0207 840 8960 or go on the website www.paladinservice.co.uk. If you're experiencing domestic violence, call the National Domestic Violence Helpline free phone 0800 2247. In the US, if you're experiencing domestic abuse and need advice, shelter, safety or counselling, call the Genesis 24-hour hotline 214-946-4357 or go on the website www.genesisshelter.org or you can call the National Domestic Violence Hotline on 800-799-7233. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan, engineered by Jacob Moose Molin. Music is composed and performed by Simba Sumba. Logo art by Rob Cohen. Real Crime Profile is produced and recorded at Empire Studios LA by XG Productions.